Um, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Marty, for the invitation. Um, and to I'm just going to mute my uh, video because I'm extremely bad at not uh, being distracted by things in the corner. So um, my talk is not nearly as uh, scientific as Ziad's. And thank you, Ziad, your talk was excellent. Um, my talk is really aimed at you've got a pediatric chest X-ray in a child with suspected infection. Firstly, do you know what you're looking at? And hopefully I can give you some tips and tricks just to make it a little bit more um, uh, user friendly, if I put it that way, because radiology can sometimes seem quite exhausting. So when you're looking at a pediatric chest X-ray, the first thing I would say is if you're taking the X-ray, what are you taking it for? Um, what are you looking for? Why are you taking the X-ray? I think sometimes there's a knee-jerk reaction uh, to take an X-ray because you can, because uh, it's easily available um, and it gives you and maybe the parents um, a sense of, uh, you know, greater um, satisfaction in a way that you're doing something. But please consider that every time you're doing that, there's a dose. And certainly in these um, children that have repeated chest infections, if you're doing an AP and a lateral chest X-ray every single time, um, the dose is not inconsiderable. Um, and uh, in addition, sometimes just with follow-up, you could probably just make do with an AP. So what am I going to cover in this talk? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about technique because I think it's, it's something that nobody really learns properly. And so there's a lot of things that are related to technique that can look like um, pathology. We're then just going to go through a systematic approach to how do you even look at a chest X-ray and then look at black and white in x-rays, because that's essentially what we're looking at. Um, and uh, we'll have a little bit of a, a summary with some uh, cases in between. So what is a good chest x-ray? Um, that's the first thing. Firstly, just to remember, it's completely different to adults. In most cases, you're taking APs, not PAs. You have a fast moving target in front of you that really doesn't want to lie still. Um, and really doesn't want really to have anything to do with uh, the radiographer that's taking it. So the fact that um, uh, radiographers are able to even get decent chest x-rays in children, particularly young infants, is quite miraculous. What we are wanting to see is a straight film in which the clavicles are located over the upper mediastinum or th below the thoracic inlet. We want to look at the anterior ribs, which should all be angled about 30 to 45 degrees downwards. And what is far easier in pediatrics than in adults where we are all taught to look at the clavicles for rotation and, and look at the posterior ribs is to focus on those anterior ribs. So in a normal chest X-ray, we would like to see five to six full anterior ribs. So if this is your fifth anterior rib, you're seeing the whole thing. So why is that important? Well, the effect, firstly, as we know, the effect of inspiration um, on the same patient. So this is a pediatric patient with a suspected chest infection. As you can see on this, we have only got four anterior ribs. We usually use the right side, so we're always looking at the same thing. One, two, three, four. We can't see the whole of the fifth rib. So this is actually a poorly inspired x-ray. And you might say, well, why does it matter? Because I can see the pneumonia in the right upper lobe. Well, this is exactly the same patient who now has got a better inspired X-ray. In fact, we're seeing almost seven anterior ribs, although it is a little bit lordotic, so we can't really say that it's hyperinflated. But you can see how less impressive. This is taken on the same day. Um, the uh, clinician didn't, or didn't realize that the X-ray had already been taken. The radiographer didn't check that the X-ray had already been taken, both sort of red flags in terms of um, radiation, but it does just show you the effect. And maybe on this one, you would be going, oh, this looks like bacterial pneumonia. The patient needs to be admitted. Maybe on this one, you'd be going, oh, well, could this be more viral? And do we really need to have antibiotics? Um, so you can see the effect of that. So obviously, if we do have a correctly um, positioned and um, inspired X-ray, when we see more than five anterior ribs, so as in this case, seven anterior ribs, we can confidently say that there is um, air trapping from whatever reason in our setting um, and in children, most commonly peripheral airways obstruction. But we can see that. And if you do have a lateral, that can be confirmed by looking at flattened diaphragms on the lateral or looking at increased retrosternal air. So here's our excellent um, 
frontal projection. Again, as you can see, it is a slightly older child if you look at the epiphyses. So what's the other thing you need to look at? So the first thing is the degree of inspiration. The second one is the rotation. So again, looking at those anterior ribs, what we want to be looking at is that both anterior ribs on each side are of similar length. And you might say, well, what's the problem? Who really cares? Well, actually, it makes a significant difference. So look at this patient, anterior ribs on the right, anterior ribs on the left. This patient is rotated towards the right, towards the side of which the rib is shorter. And the reason that, that this is so significant is because the shorter side or the side towards which the patient is turned will be darker or more loosened. So if you aren't aware of this, you might be going, oh, I've got a hyperlucent right lung. Do I have nodes? Do I have a foreign body? Do I have a patient who's got bronchiolitis obliterans on that side? You need to be looking at technique before you can assess the x-ray. And then the one that unfortunately is most common and most frustrating is the lordotic projection. So as soon as you see clavicles that are coming out of the neck, now we all know you've, most of you are involved with children, you know that there is no congenital condition in which your clavicles are sticking out the side of your cervical vertebra. Um, we have never seen one. Uh, please show me if you have one. We can have obviously uh, cervical ribs, um, which would be C7, but at no point do we ever see ribs coming out the side of the neck. So when we see that, it should instantly alert us to look at our ribs, look at our anterior ribs in this patient, they're all going up. This means that the patient is grossly lordotic. And why is that important? Although yes, we can, we can talk about airspace pacification within the lungs or whiteness. What we can't comment on is the heart size or shape. Because the heart is pushed forward in a lordotic projection, it looks like it's a right ventricular type um, uh, shape to the heart. The apex looks like it's sort of pushed into a boot. And you also can't comment on the degree of hyperinflation. So, you know, even if your patient is wheezing, you can't really call it on a chest x-ray if it's lordotic. And uh, yeah, this is the hardest thing to actually um, manage to do. So we all also know about the thymus, just to remind you, the thymus is easily seen on the frontal projection. If you don't know where it is on the lateral, it's anterior, and it should never affect the uh, trachea um, or the esophagus. And if you are concerned about a thymus, um, obviously, in this patient with acute upper airway obstruction, it is quite clear that this thymus is very dense. Look at the normal thymus, you can see vessels through it. The abnormal thymus is dense, you may see calcification, and if you ultrasound it, it looks very heterogeneous. This is a patient who had a germ cell tumor. So um, a thymus should not displace anything or compress it. So one last thing with just with looking at normals is to look at the cardiothoracic ratio. Now, as we know, because of the thymus, we allow the cardiothoracic ratio to be about up to 60% um, in patients uh, up to the age of four years. So just another rider is if you see a patient where say, for example, it is 60%, so clearly this one's bigger, but say, for example, this was 60%. Note how hyperinflated this patient is. So if you count the anterior ribs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we've almost got eight anterior ribs. This patient is hyperinflated. Now, as with those um, patients that we remember from when we were all doing adults years ago, patients with severe emphysema that are hyperinflated, their hearts always look small. And if they start to look big, they've probably got pulmonary hypertension. In a patient who's got a normal sized heart, if they are hyperinflated, you need to consider that they've got cardiomegaly. So in this one, it's easy because you can see that the lungs are plethoric and probably there's also some interstitial pulmonary edema. But in a patient who may not have that, be very, very careful in the setting of a normal sized heart when you've got hyperinflation. That patient needs to be carefully evaluated for an underlying cardiac abnormality. And that's why much like CR, there's a red flag on this, um, on this study. So we all know that air is black, and we know that lucent implies a black or darker lung. So once you've looked at the technical factors and looked at the cardiothoracic ratio, the next thing I suggest you look at, because if you don't look at it, you'll miss it, is to look at what you expect to be black. Because we, unfortunately, we're all trained when we look at an x-ray. The first thing we go is, oh, look, it's white there. There must be consolidation. Is there a pleural effusion? Is there a mass? And we tend to then just not look at the the part that is actually most obvious, which is the part that's black, which is the air. 
So you all should be aware of this, that the normal trachea, uh, subglottic trachea has got shoulders, as in your shoulders or mine. And when we have the steepled appearance, it's um, as a result of subglottic edema, most commonly seen in croup or laryngotracheobronchitis, but can also see, be seen post-intubation or with um, uh, bacterial tracheitis. But when you're starting to look at the airway, you should be looking from the subglottic region down. Not a great film, I have magnified it, but just to another reminder is once you're coming down, you've seen those shoulders, you follow the trachea all the way down to its bifurcation. If you have a poor inspiration, your trachea will be buckled. So it doesn't necessarily mean pathology. What is normal is that you should be able to follow that trachea all the way down to the right and left main bronchus, and you should be able to see a left-sided aortic arch. And as you can see here in this nicely well-inspired film, your trachea should be going down the midline. It's also normal if it goes slightly towards the right because we have a left-sided aortic arch, and particularly, as I've just said, in the case of a poor inspiration. So what about this? Both of these tracheas are abnormal. Remember, we just discussed that the trachea, as it goes into the mediastinum, can go slightly to the right as it goes in through the thoracic inlet if there's a poor inspiration, which is not the case on either of these films. We then allow it to go even more to the right because we're expecting a normal left-sided aortic arch. So what about these? In both these cases, you can see that the trachea is displaced to the left. So we have to account for that. In our patient on the left, the first thing we have to do is go, where is the aortic arch? And with our boot-shaped heart, you can see that the aortic arch is right-sided and that is explaining the tracheal's, devi the tracheal's deviation. Whereas on the left, sorry, you can go back, you can see you've got a left-sided aortic arch. So in this case, the trachea is being displaced by paratracheal lymphadenopathy. And if you look more closely, you can obviously see hyalur lymphadenopathy and airspace opacification in the right lower lobe in a patient with pulmonary tuberculosis. Many people find the lateral difficult. What are we trying to see on the lateral? We are trying to see a trachea that is parallel and straight with relation to the esophagus behind it. Just go back. Do you see those two straight loosened channels? the trachea and the esophagus. And don't forget that we always have density around the hilum because we've got the arch and we've got the pulmonary arteries. But what is important is that you can see vessels through them, their normal structures. So compare that with this, in which we've got the aorta and the trachea, but look how dense that hilar region is. This is that so-called pancake appearance of a patient that's got pulmonary tuberculosis. So once you've looked at those airways, then you need to be look, taking it beyond that. We've looked at the black of the trachea, the black of the main bronchi. Now we're going to look at the lungs. We need to critically evaluate the lungs to go, is the lung black? Is it normally black? Have we got symmetrical blackness or lucency of the lungs? Or, or is it asymmetrical? Before we start concentrating on things that are white. Okay, and there is a list here, um, obviously you can, I presume, go back and look at this on your website. I'm not, uh, due to time constraints, I'm not going to go through this. But remember, we're looking at technical factors, air outside the lung, a big lung because of ball valve obstruction, either inside or outside, or are we looking at a lung that is normal or abnormal? So here is your first case. And remember, the first thing you do when you see a lung that is more loosened than the contralateral lung is to look for rotation. So of course, this patient may also have swallowed a foreign body, but the first thing to do is to go, could it be technical? So in this case, our lucency is purely technical and related to rotation. What about this case? This is a child who's intubated. You can see that they've got a, um, a central line and they've got a nasogastric tube. There is a difference in lucency between the right and the left lung. So in the ICU setting, the first thing you're gonna do is go, could the increased lucency in this patient be due to air outside the lung or a pneumothorax. And then you have to carefully evaluate to see the edge of the lung. And an important thing is to always look, if you're not sure, down at the costophrenic angles, because if you have what we call a deep black sulcus sign, that is a good sign of air. And remember also that sometimes in small pneumothoraces, when the patient is lying on their back, the air goes anterior, and that may be your only clue. 
So what about this patient? Just going on what uh, Ziad showed us earlier. So this patient had the opposite effect of what his patient Tom had. And in this patient with a persistent cough who has a chest X-ray, yes, it's easy to see the fact that we have got a radio opaque foreign body here, which was, this is a girl with a hair clip. Um, which is actually protruding into the upper lobe bronchus. But the first thing you should be doing is going, well, actually the left lung is more loosened than the right. And I can't account for it by the rotation because the patient isn't rotated. So therefore, let me look at the airways, obviously quite diff difficult. This is a, a slightly larger patient, but you would want to then follow the trachea down, see if you can see the right and left main bronchus. And obviously in this case, we can see a radio opaque foreign body, but if there was any concern and there was no other cause for it, such as lympha lymphadenopathy um, or a visible mass or something that looked like a vascular ring, then you would have to be considering um, an ingested, maybe radio lucent or radio opaque foreign body. So here's another one, and I hope by now you're getting the you're getting the gist of what I'm trying to say. We need to look at the airways. So we start off looking from the subglottic region down. We're looking at the right main bronchus. We're looking at the left main bronchus. In this case, we're going the right lung is denser than the left. So which one's abnormal? Is it the right lung that's got pacification, or is it the left? But the left does look bigger than the right. And in every patient, we need to critically evaluate the airways because we know that pediatric patients have got airway disease. When we look more closely, you can see the left main bronchus, the right, not so easy. Is it there? Isn't it there? We used to do high KV views. Now we do actually a low dox. If any of you have got a low dox in your department, low dose x-ray that you use for trauma. If you're trying to look at the airways, it's excellent for seeing bronchi. Um, and what do we do? We then go, let's look on the lateral. Here we've got lymphadenopathy. So if we go back, we go, okay, this is probably a bit wider than it should be. Yes, this is round, the right hilum, so it probably is lymphadenopathy. And in the setting of a patient who's got quite a long area of narrowing of the left main bronchus and a black lung, probably bull valve obstruction from nodes in the setting of TB. Okay, I've got, I think, one or two more for you. This patient, long history of wheezing, stridor, actually, when you ask the mother carefully. We see the AP projection, we can see the lucent left lung. Can we see the airways? No, I'll admit it's a bad x-ray, it happens. Sometimes we can't see the airways, but that's why we also need to always look at our lateral. So remember what I said from the beginning, two parallel lucent tubes. Sometimes we don't see the esophagus or it's big and distended because it's full of air, but we need to have a straight trachea with parallel walls. And in this case, we don't. So in a patient that's got a lucent lung, that's got a history of stridor, what are we thinking? We need to be considering now a vascular ring. And in this patient, you can see from the CT, um, we've got a double aortic arch and exactly what we were expecting, anterior compression. This is the nasogastric tube of the trachea. So AP and lateral, if, you look, if you're doing a lateral, you need to know what you're looking at. And then of course, this one, this is the one that unfortunately always foxes everybody because this was a much older patient. Um, than a baby or a young infant. This was a five-year-old or six-year-old that had had recurrent, what was called asthma, um, peripheral airways obstruction. Now I'm going to shoot myself in the foot here because I will be going, we really shouldn't be taking x-rays on everybody who comes in with peripheral airways obstruction if you think it's bronchiolitis um, or you think it's asthma. But in this patient, his mom reported that she had gone to GPs for years. Um, this was in the Northern Hemisphere, where actually there is um, much better access to healthcare in the public sector. And she had been going to GPs and he'd been labeled as asthma. And he was on various inhalers and he'd never really been referred out of the uh, primary healthcare setting until he became acutely short of breath on a weekend, was brought into an A&E or an emergency unit and had this chest X-ray. So of course, your first thought, which it should be, is, oh, Something's going on here that's white and it looks a little bit collapsed. And you know, what's going on in the left lung? So here's the heart, but there's all this opacification. You know, what's going on? Obviously the left lung must be abnormal. But then when you start critically evaluating it and you go, okay, well, let's look at the two lungs. Is the blackness of the right normal? As in, can we see normal vessels going throughout it? And is it of similar size to the left? Well, no, the left one looks smaller. The right one, can we see vessels? No, is it due to the, the X-ray um, 
the dose, maybe, maybe it's been um, overexposed, but we cannot say that this is a normal chest x-ray. And therefore we have to go, could there be something else? So in this patient, because of the lack of vessels on the right, he went on to have a CT because there was a concern. And as you can see, all of what you are seeing here on the chest x-ray is actually the left upper lobe, which is herniating across to the contralateral, sorry, the right upper lobe herniating across to the contralateral side. Here is our small little left lobe, but with normal vessels, mediastinum over. And in fact, this is a chronically compressed stroke collapsed right middle and right lower lobe. And this is a patient who had congenital lobar overinflation, used to be called congenital lobar over um, emphysema. He hadn't had an antenatal lung scan. It was, you know, it was a number of years ago. He fell through the cracks. But, you know, in a patient, as Ziad said, who had chronic recurrent symptoms, he really had an indication for further imaging, for further investigation with chest X-ray and referral to a more tertiary center. Okay, so just carrying on with lucent lesions, and I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna go a little bit faster. Let's talk about lucencies that have got a fluid level. Um, classic in an infant on, um, on the left side of your screen is a CPAM, and don't confuse it with a congenital diaphragmatic hernia on the right. And these patients do often present at birth, but they may present later on with multiple thin walled cysts. And we often have a discussion about, was there an infection? Is this now related to post um, infectious pneumatoceles? Is it in fact an underlying congenital um, pulmonary airway malformation? And what should we do to take it forward? Again, there has to be a clinical context to this. So if, if you've got a patient who's never had an infection, hasn't got any infections, um, then you would be going down a different imaging algorithm than, for example, um, if you've got a patient who has had a uh, history of, say, strep and staph infections. Both of these are neonates. So um, as you can see um, on the left, we've got mediastinal shift. Here's our stomach bubble, but it very much does very much does look more like colon, and we couldn't see a colon within the abdomen. So here is what I mean by post-infectious pneumatoceles. They can be very large. We've often had vigorous debate at Red Cross about whether or not these should be um, managed rather than left. Um, and th because they do, they look terrifying. They look like you're going to send the child back to wherever it comes from and it's going to pop a pneumothorax and that's where you're going to be. But our cardiothoracic surgeons, unless there really is significant mediastinal shift, are quite reticent to, to get involved because generally if the patient is well, they do... Uh, resolve on their own and quite often um, if you've got parents that are able to seek attention and are given the warning signs um, when you follow them up they do get smaller over time of course this you can see a fluid level right upper lobe um, ap and lateral in a patient with pneumonia who's developed a lung abscess and what's the only reason you might be going well this is so easy why are you showing us this it's just to remember always interrogate the fluid level because when you do have an air fluid level, you need to interrogate it on the frontal and lateral projection and look very carefully at its size, which I will go into later in the talk, but also at how smooth it is. So this is a patient with a bacterial lung abscess, whereas this patient, you can see large air fluid level on the left. The patient was not particularly septic, but did have shortness of breath. And you can see an undulating margin. And this is completely different in that this patient has now got a complicated hydatid cyst, um, which has ruptured. So interrogate two things, the, the length of the um, fluid level, as well as um, its regularity or irregularity. Okay, so two more things to cover. One is white on an x-ray. So everybody gets very um, concerned about how to, um, the nomenclature, this is a, an extremely good website, Radiology Assistant. It's got, um, certainly for those of you that are in training, it's got great, very simple explanations of exactly how you um, can explain or report things, nomenclature and differential diagnoses. Um, so I really do, um, it's, it's free, it's, um, it's uh, a radiology um, online um, uh, source and it's, it's really as good. So. Consolidation is what we call airspace. Interstitial is things that are involving the interstitium of the lung. 
um, and then obviously nodules and masses in atelectasis. So consolidation or airspace opacification is something that fills the alveoli or airspaces with something of fluid content. So in pneumonia, it's going to be pus, hemorrhage blood, fluid in ARDS or pulmonary edema, and cells um, if you um, also in ARDS and in patients that may have malignancy. Its pattern could be low bar, multi-low bar, multifocal, diffuse bilateral, et cetera, and that's more descriptive. But the important thing is that it obscures vessels, and usually because it's dense, you can see the bronchi through it. And that's what we call an air bronchogram that looks like a tree. So air is still getting into the bronchi, and so they look like the branches of a tree, black branches of a tree in amongst the foliage. And as you can see, this is the descriptive picture. This is what it would look like on an X-ray. And if you do an ultrasound, you get this dense um, consolidation, which almost looks like a liver. And within it, you will get these little sparkling bits of light, which is the air within the bronchi or the air bronchogram. So this would be a diffuse bilateral pattern in a patient who's got a ventricular peritoneal shunt, has got a nasogastric tube, has got severe bilateral pneumonia. And you can see air bronchograms, implying that this is a consolidative or airspace type pattern. Again, clinical context is important. So if you told me this, this child had come in with an HP of one and, and blood pouring out of its nose and mouth and nasogastric and out of whatever, I would go, okay, well, is this hemorrhage? Um, if you tell me the child's severely septic, I'm going to go, well, it's more likely to be pneumonia. Again, clinical context, and that's why we like you to give us clinical histories on x-ray forms so that we don't look like idiots when we write our reports. Um, when you are looking for something that's more low bar, you obviously are going to be looking for your signs. You're going to lose the right heart border, or you're going to lose the right or left hemidiaphragm. And then when you're looking at it, you're going, is it the whole lobe? Is it half the lobe? Or is it causing volume loss in the lobe. So in this case, we've got right middle lobe because we've lost the right heart border. You can see that it's very dense, so it's probably air space. And it's, we don't see any air bronchograms and it's actually smaller than it should be. So this is probably related to mucus plugging and um, right middle lobe collapse um, as a result of mucus plugging. And when you look again at the blackness of the lungs and you count the ribs and you see that the patient's hyperinflated both on the lateral and the AP. This would fit with a patient with peripheral airways obstruction who's got mucus plugging and has plugged off the, the um, right middle lobe bronchus with or without super added infection. Thank you Ziad for bringing up what you brought up because this is if you take nothing away from this um, from this talk please remember this review area. So this is a patient who presented with a cough and a fever and this was called normal, okay? So there is one very important review area that you need to always look at, and we miss it because it's part of the white part of the, of the chest X-ray, and so we tend not to look there because we're looking in the lungs. This triangle at the back is both lower lobes. So both lower lobes are projected into that triangle, and it should always be white, I mean black. If there's anything white in it, it's abnormal. Okay, so in this one, okay, we do have some vessels. You have to allow for vessels, guys. They, they're everywhere in the lung. But when you look at our patient, look at the triangle at the back. This is white, okay? And when you look at the hemidiaphragms, you can't see the back half of this left hemidiaphragm. You can see the whole right one. And then go back and look how dense it is behind the heart. So this is just an important review area because it's a place where pneumonia is missed. And this is a case in point. This was a 10 year old boy with recurrent, quite severe respiratory tract infections that re had required him to be admitted multiple times to hospital for IV antibiotics. This um, was uh, a patient who had had multiple chest X-rays. Um, he'd been worked up for immunodeficiency, which was negative. He had no TB contacts. Um, he had no smokers in the family, there was no A to P really, and you might say, well, he looks a bit hyperinflated, he was actually a much older child, so you also have to take into account that sometimes they can take a really good deep inspiration. Anyway, there must have been, I don't know, about 20 or 30 x-rays that he had had over the years. So, before we go, we need to remember that one thing, remember our normal um, lower lobes, the black triangle, 
look at him. It's not black. There is something going on here. And just to remind you, one other cause of recurrent infections, this patient had a sequestration. So um, he had an intralobar sequestration. We can see it, see it here. So if you're sort of looking at this oblique, this is what we were looking at in the lower lobe. This is what we were looking at in the lower lobe. He had it resected and had no further infections. So it, it does, sorry, that's my timer telling me that my time is up. Bilateral pattern, bronchopneumonia. Bronchopneumonia is a clinical diagnosis. Round pneumonia, you're all aware of. And then just to go quickly through ground glass, it's an interstitial pattern that looks like ground glass. Um, when we ultrasound it, it looks like this. You can see nothing through it. And it also has a wide differential, viral or atypical pneumonias, hemorrhage, edema, all of that is, um, is in your differential. I'm not gonna go through focal lesions because I've run out of time. And I just want to say one other thing, obviously with pleura, it's important to do ultrasounds because you may just see black fluid, which is uncomplicated versus pus. And one other thing, sorry, I'm going over time. This is the one Tracy, thing I promised you. Tracy, yeah. please take another five minutes and go for okay. those, please. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I got, you see, I get too enthusiastic and then I, I lose my way and, and um, lose the time. So if you've got round focal lesions, what you need to be thinking is, is it related to a lobe? Is it a mass? Um, in this case, you can see it fits the anatomy of the upper lobe. Remember where the upper lobe is, but here we've got a bulging horizontal fissure. So it's an expansile pneumonia, a bulging fissure. What's the commonest cause in our setting? Again, depends on whether the patient is well or un is unwell. So in this patient, not so unwell, certainly wasn't septic, but had a history of loss of weight. So obviously our commonest um, uh, cause in is uh, TB with an expansile pneumonia, which he had. Converse, conversely, look at this. So it's a much more focal lesion, not involving the whole lobe. This looks more like a mass. So good way to interrogate it is to ultrasound it because you're gonna be able to know then, does it have fluid in it? Does it have complex fluid in it? Um, or is it solid? So in this case, it had um, just normal black fluid in it, hydatid cyst. Okay, as I was just saying about pleura, sometimes it's difficult. We always used to be taught in radiology, if you could see sort of tethering or apparent tethering, then it was more likely to be an empyema than, um, than a simple pleural effusion. I, I found to my um, detriment that that isn't always the case, but ultrasound, as you know, because I'm sure you're all doing it, um, shows you very beautifully um, where the fluid is, where the deepest fluid is. Um, important to maybe, if you're asking your radiologist to do it, ask them to mark in the position in which you are going to be doing the tap. So if you're going to be doing the tap with the patient supine, which is usually the case, ask them to mark it in the supine position. Because quite often as radiologists, when the child is screaming, and it's, it's sometimes easier to get them to hug their moms, sit on the bed, and then we'll mark it with them upright. And then the fluid may move when you're trying to do your tap. So it's important to know how that was done. And then again, this one, mediastinal shift, but you can see the pus, very thick, um, fluid, which, as you know, with your fibrinolytics um, goes very well. Okay, so just one thing with regards the that abscess we talked about. So if something is within the lung, and it's got a fluid level, it's quite easy to diagnose, because if you look on the frontal and lateral projection, usually it's around the same. Now, the rider to that is if it's absolutely enormous, sometimes it's more difficult. But what about this case? So this is a pyonumothorax, the gas is actually not in the lung, in a lung abscess, but it is in the pleural space. And why is that important? That's important because if you see this in the middle of the night, you're going to want to be draining it rather than leaving it um, to be going, oh, this is a lung abscess. We'll talk to the cardiothoracic surgeons in the morning, especially if the patient's really, really septic because this is pus and gas. So what are the sort of clues? Well, the clue is if you look on this frontal and lateral projection. Now, you might say, oh, but I remember your hydatid all the way back at the beginning of the talk, and that was, um, was wider on the lateral than the frontal. So obviously, as, I, as you'll see on my next slide, it doesn't always work. So for example, if you have got an absolutely enormous intraparenchymal lesion, clearly you're going to have difference. But in most cases, if you, for example, now have a lesion within the lung, we're now looking you can see my crude vertebral body at the back, the mediastinum in the middle, there's your lung abscess. 
If you look on the frontal projection, which is what I'm showing you from the front, that's the X-ray from the front, it'll be that wide. And on the lateral projection, it'll be similar. Whereas if it's completely surrounding the lung as in a pyre pneumothorax, on the frontal projection, it's gonna be so wide, but on the lateral, it's gonna be much wider. So that gives you a clue that it might be pleural rather than parenchymal. The rider being, if it is an enormous lesion, we obviously can't tell. And then my final slide, and apologies for going over time, is with all chest x-rays, as I said, we focus on the white. So this is obviously a horrifically lordotic projection because we've got the, the, the um, clavicles coming out the neck. Our, virtual, our um, anterior ribs are going up, we can, but we can see the airspace. And so we're very proud of ourselves that we can see the airspace here. This is a patient that deteriorated in ICU. Query pneumothorax. So we start looking black, black, black. Do we see anything? Oh, no, we don't see anything. We don't see that deep sulcus sign that she talked about. Don't forget to look beneath the hemidiaphragms because in this case, the cause of the um, sudden distress was the pneumoperitoneum. But often, if you look beneath the diaphragm, you might see portal venous gas, for example, in an NEC. You may see no gas in a neonate. And in fact, their respiratory distress is because they've got a soft gel atresia. So you do have a little bit of the abdomen to look at. Look at it. And I haven't had time to go through it. But the other last review area needs to be the bones. So thank you very much for your attention. Clinical context is important. But remember to go through these um, x-rays systematically, or you will move things will miss things and don't forget the lower lobe. Thanks very much. And again, apologies for going over time.